Hi, uh, good morning or good afternoon to you all. Um, and thank you for joining uh, this webinar or this webcast, better said, that is included on the Global Thought Leadership Series by Watchful Software. Um, my name is Rui Bishkaya. I represent Watchful Software, but I will not take part on this webcast as this needs to be and is intended to be uh, a vendor neutral um, webcast in which we ask a moderator that you will meet uh, in just a second and uh, um, two uh, seasoned experienced um, security um, experts to share their insights on um, DLP strategies in this case. So once again, thank you for joining. And if I may ask, um, so or if I may introduce uh, who the people are that you will be talking to, and at the end, you will have a Q&A session. So first and foremost, let me introduce you. Maru Shiok is, is currently um, a security and technology executive advisor. He has been the CISO for Slumberger and now is a fellow at Slumberger, an oil and gas conglomerate. So Mario will be the moderator for this panel discussion. And we are extremely pleased to be joined by Ariel Silverstone, which is the VP for Security Strategy at GoDaddy, and Kim Jones, which is the Senior VP and Chief Security Officer at Vantiv. Um, so Mario will, you know, give you a little bit of an introduction also to Ariel and Kim. I'm just here to give you a little bit of the house rules. Um, so all of you are uh, centrally muted, so there's no need for you to be mute and unmute yourself. Um, and also, you know, please understand and please know that this uh, webcast is being recorded and you will have access to it on demand, you know, later, if not today, tomorrow on watchfulsoftware.com and you will also receive an email later on with a link and some follow-up instructions on where to go or where can you get um, the slide deck and also a recording of the webinar. There will be, as I've said, a Q&A session at the end in which you are welcome to ask all the questions that uh, you may have. And for that, if you can uh, leverage the question um, capability on the GoToWebinar uh, toolbar, um, we will make sure that at the end on the Q&A session, you know, uh, if we have time, these gentlemen are able to answer to those questions. So without further ado, um, I'll end it over to you, Mario. Thank you very much for being the, the uh, host and, uh, and the moderator of this. Thank you. Thank you, Rui. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to do is just go through the agenda. We have just finished the introductions and the house rules. Uh, right next, we will do a little uh, introduction to data loss prevention, the goals that you should have and the requirements to implement data loss prevention. And then we'll have some questions to our panelists and uh, some questions that I have and some questions that we will uh, have from you. And last, we will just go very quickly from some key takeaways and that's it. So, let's see, can you see it, my screen? Okay, so the first thing that I just wanted to introduce as, as far as DLP, I have a lot of people that question about DLP and many people believe that DLP is just a product or a technology that you, know, you can just put it in and it's magic and everything will work. Uh, based on my experience, DLP is not necessarily that way and many of the DLP products have been focused on a specific problem or a specific solution for a specific vertical. So in my opinion, DLP is a strategy to mitigate data loss risk and the strategy can use many products, not just one product. And in addition to that, uh, uh, there is other technologies that can be used. But what is really, really more important is that people need to understand that in addition to the technology, we need to have people and processes. From the people perspective, we need to make sure that we have proper training and awareness. Without proper training and awareness of our people, no DLP solution is going to work very well. And from the process perspective, we need to make sure that we have the proper uh, 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 classifications and proper processes to watermark, fingerprint the documents and the files 
because without that, we are not protected. So, so it's not just about technology, it's about people and processes also. Okay, so on this next slide, uh, what I wanted to do is, when we go and try to have a data loss prevention program, we want to make sure that we have a goal, and the goal should be to prevent information leakage and reduce the insider threat. Because one of the big problems that we have with information leakage is that many times, many of the people that may be leaking the information are insiders that do have access to it. And this is a typical case where encryption may not work because they, the insider does have access to decrypt the, the, the information. The objective is to track high value data because trying to protect all of the data, it could not be possible, especially in a very large company. And you need to be able to watermark, fingerprint and protect very easily because if you make it very difficult, people will not do it. The strategy should be to complement products that we already have and make it as easy to use as possible so people will be you know uh, 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 following the process and the tactic tactic that i believe it should be is to make it mandatory to classify without classification it's very difficult to have a data loss prevention okay next slide okay so the goals and requirements for uh, having a data loss prevention program is to prevent information leaks. Data being compromised could be intentionally or accidentally. Today, we have sometimes people that are, they get Trojanized or they, uh, uh, um, without wanting to, they can uh, make a mistake and data can be leaked very easily. And, and today, with, with a lot of the new technologies such as mobi mobility and cloud, it makes it even easier. Uh, data must be protected from unauthorized consumption. One click that can classify, protect, watermark, fingerprint, a file or email, it is, it is needed. Uh, we have, my experience is that I have tried many types of data loss prevention tools, and it, it, when it makes it too complicated, people will just bypass it. Then integrate seamlessly uh, into the user workflow. You do not want the user to do multiple things in a non-sequential way. You want to make sure it's automated as part of their workflow. Extend to multiple platforms and file types. Multiple platforms meaning that we want to be able to protect the information regardless what kind of device you use, whether it's your desktop, whether it's your laptop, whether it's your tablet or your mobile device. And as far as, as, far as file types is concerned, we need to go beyond just the basic uh, uh, Office, uh, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint documents and be able to protect other documents such as uh, PDF files or AutoCAD files where, uh, so, so we need to, it needs to cover a large range of, of file types. Uh, safeguard information on mobile devices, we already talked about that. Allow for richer and more complete audit trail of secret data. When you handle secret data, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to keep track of it uh, from the time that it gets, it, gets, it gets classified. And if anybody opens it from then on, make sure where they open it and who open it. And it needs to be, the, the last item is it needs to be easy to use. It needs to be easy to implement and easy to support because if you don't have that, then the 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 the, the, the what ends up being is what I call shelfware. Okay, so okay, so the the next thing that I wanted to do is uh, go over some uh, questions with our panelists. So the first question is, what is your training and awareness strategy for DLP. Um, I don't know, uh, Ariel, do you want to answer that or Kim? Thank you for asking, yes, this yeah. is Ariel. <clears throat> it's a very interesting world we live in. Uh, data by itself has very little value unless it's either flowing or being processed. So when 
the data leaves the protected enterprise or the protected, ideally, encrypted storage is when we get stability and risk from it. Which uh, means that when we look at DLP, and in the case of GoDaddy, we look at DLP both for ourselves and sometimes for our customers, uh, we have a situation that we need to be, number one, unobtrusive as possible, as you said. And number two, it needs to be a part of the entire data lifecycle management program. So first, data classification you mentioned. So we have to decide what is general data, what is restricted, what is confidential. We have to make sure the data is understood to be such by the systems. But the single most important element before we talk software and hardware would be comprehensive awareness, training, and retraining of the workforce to make sure that number one, they handle data like it should be held, handled, and number two, that when they see an exception, that they let us know that we can continuously improve delivery of service. Very good. Uh, Kim, you have anything to complement that? And the only thing that I would add, and I'd agree with uh, what Ariel has said, the big piece for me is that recognition piece. I mean, there are certain data elements and data types which fall, particularly within the regulated environment that I tend to operate in, that are very, very clearly you know, my most sensitive pieces and parts of, um, of data that I'm looking to protect. The challenge is there are other types of data that fall into that high sensitivity, a high security category that may or may not be recognized at face value. So a lot of my training program focuses on recognizing what constitutes sensitive data within our environment. From there, yes, the cascading follow-ons as to how we deal with it in a life cycle fashion and what tools or technologies are available and who to go to when you have questions or the follow-ons from the education piece. But that recognition piece for me is key. Excellent, uh, Kim. So the next question is, what steps have you implemented to mitigate bring your own device? Uh, uh, Kim, you want to start with that one? Yeah. Um, I, I go back, Mario, to where you started and where we started within this presentation. Yeah. Uh, from the standpoint that DLP is a strategy and is driven not just by technology, but by people and process. I mean, obviously we all understand, and I'm taking this question specifically down the DLP path versus opening up a very wide BYOD discussion, which is beyond the scope of, I think, what we're trying to do here today. So yes, we all understand that if I'm processing and transacting my sensitive data on systems that are wholly owned, operated, and managed by me and have limited to no mobility within the environment or staying within my facilities, that's an easier use case or easier problem than, say, that data ending up on my iPad, a cell phone, or even a personal laptop that I allow within the environment. But strategically, I tend to take a look at from the standpoint, my sensitive data requires strategically a certain level of protection and control. So then the question becomes how I exercise that protection and control in a level of sliding scale implementation, not only on my devices, but on devices that aren't fully within my control. And if I can't exercise the same level of control that I can on that, mo on that mobile device versus what I can on my own internal device or a personal device versus my own internal device, then what does that do to the risk profile and what risk are we willing to accept or entertain within the environment? You know, I, I've worked with a couple of larger entities who, as you look at a BYOD problem and some entities that actually have taken uh, the standpoint of we have to allow in a very rapid developing environment a lot of technologies in here, even in some cases a lot of competitive technologies, the issue then becomes the more control you give me and the more invasive you allow me to uh, be within the device, the more latitude I can give you to do certain things on that device which may or may not include processing or storing sensitive data. 
the less amount of control or insight I have, the less latitude I can give you. So for me, the, you know, if we take a look at one of the starting paradigms you talked about, Mario, that DLP is a strategy and not just a technology, this just becomes yet another use case that I implement. Ariel? Yeah, that's a very, very, very good point. Uh, in addition to that, at GoDaddy, since we are a large uh, cloud provider, one of the largest, we have uh, the issue of DLP beyond just a BYOD as a device. We also really have it as BYOD when people want to use various cloud providing technologies, uh, which really distort and negate much of the old perimeter defense or the old version of defense in depth technologies. So we have to really focus on the data, like you said, not the device. And the importance of this being a process rather than just a plug-in technology cannot be overstated. Uh, we have to look at what it is we're protecting, when, and sometimes where in the world. Uh, it has to do from user need, it has to do as a result of government regulations which change rapidly in the United States, but also worldwide, for example, in Europe. And it also has to do from a point of view of competitive advantage. So we have to look at all different types of data, PCI, PII, and now the new definition from the EU coming as special PII, and help the enterprise, our customers, and our uh, strategic partners together analyze what data should be flowing and under what restrictions. Excellent, uh, Ariel. Uh, I just wanted to give uh, a, a, an additional comment uh, on, the, on, the, on the areas of bring your own device. It may not necessarily be people's personal own device, but it could also be the case of contractors that come in with uh, third-party companies' uh, devices. And if you start putting data on those devices, you need to make sure that the data is either protected or, or cleaned out after the engagement is finished, right? And the same way with uh, with uh, removal media right so yeah in all these cases and Mario this is Kim but in all these yeah. cases again think about the strategy and think about the process yeah. for me that's a DLP life cycle issue not mm -hmm. just with contractors and third parties but I also have a process for eliminating and destroying and verifying that data is destroyed on my own systems so part of this is just for third parties not only do does that process include the contractual obligation but also the process for me for to validate and verify that that has been done just like i would for any employee that's leaving my environment even if it's a full full-time badged employee excellent right. and i i, I really me, go ahead go ahead go ahead I'm sorry, let me just add one thing to this because this is very, very important stuff. When we look at the life cycle, there is really only two possible approaches that I can see. Uh, I, uh, actually, either you keep data forever, which is not good for many reasons, uh, confidentiality, legal reasons, etc., or you have the data that you go and purge, ideally automatically every year, every seven years, depends on the data. And the only way that we found that makes sense to do that is to pre-expire the data on a certain date. So we implement techniques, for example, in backup or storage, that after a certain date, the data is no longer readable. We don't have to worry about purging it. We don't have to worry about erasing it. We don't have to worry about all the uh, Department of Defense type deletion because the data is simply no longer the data after a specific predefined time. And that works really well for us. Excellent. So I just want everybody that's listening to us to, to understand how important it is, the life cycle of the DLP. And I think many of the products that, or, uh, uh, that, that claim to be a DLP product, they don't take that into account. So this is, this is very, very important. The next question is about how do you protect data in the cloud? because that's, that's another thing is before we had data that is either resides on our, on our, our hard drive, on our laptop or desktop, or then on our on-prem servers. Now we can put data in the cloud and that's a different way to, we need to add some additional protection to that. Can you, uh, put, uh, Ariel, you wanna? Sure, start with that? There, there are many, yeah. thank you. Yeah. There, there, there are many ways to protect data in a cloud, uh, but generally, uh, cloud is believed today to be external cloud. However, mm -hmm. 
we define cloud as all three types, which is external, internal, and hybrid. And to the degree that it is external, by definition, you lose control of the physical possession of the data. Mm -hmm. And to that, I will ask, uh, would you rather, as an enterprise, pay for the best tools, the best people, and continuous training to um, get the data protected in a, in a cloud, or would you rather go to a large provider that can afford those people and then trust them there? I would argue the data is more secure there. So the one way that is most efficient so far to protect data in the cloud is just simply to encrypt it, because by many laws and regulations, once it's encrypted, it's no longer sensitive data. However, there are other ways. Uh, not the least of which you can store parts of the data in two or more different databases, making it a, worth a lot less to a would-be uh, exfiltrator of the data. Okay, Kim, you have any comments on that? I think Ariel nailed it. I mean, the only thing I would add to that uh, is one, remember, yes, encrypted, but you keep the keys. I know that's obvious to us. We're security yeah. geeks, but let's remember that. <laughs> Encrypting and yeah. giving them the keys really doesn't help. Uh, the other piece of this is all, all of these things, again, for me, amount to another case of just balancing risk. And, you know, you're right. If you've got someone who is an experienced, trusted provider and purveyor who actually is providing the skill sets and the training to protect the data, yes, the data can be more secure within a third-party environment. However, I still have, particularly in a regulated environment, the responsibility for due care and due diligence to ensure that that third party is doing the things that I need to do. So the only counterpoint that I would offer you know, to what Ariel said is remember that if we do choose to head down that path in terms of using a third party provider to store our data, it doesn't abrogate my need to exercise due care and due diligence to ensure that that very experienced service provider is actually providing me a service to a level of security that I not only expect, but in some cases I'm required to meet. So, so that's that's good. Uh, uh, the, the the question that I have is, you know, so how do you so in when you are on prem? and you have your data on-prem, you can put sensors around it in order to monitor your DLP. So whenever the information is going out of your network, you can detect that. How can you do that in the cloud? Well, wait a minute. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's think about this strategically if I have yeah. a second here. Sure. The data is sitting so, and let's think about it when it's on-prem in your data center, which may be 300 miles away mm -hmm. from your admin offices. You know, all security boils down to IAAA. I've got to identify who it is, I've got to authorize them, I've got to give them a certain level of access, and then I have to create a system of auditing or accountability for that. So I have this same problem in any sort of internal distributed network environment where I'm talking about accessing data that's not physically sitting on your system, but is on a mainframe somewhere 300 miles away in order for people to gain access to the systems. Why is that problem any different now that it's a third-party provider? It's still an IAAA problem. The only thing that I've lost, potentially, is the physical access to the box or the device or the server, which I can have some level of positive control because the facility 300 miles away is still my facility. But there are restrictions and things and controls and requirements not only contractually, but from a due diligence standpoint and from an audit standpoint, or hell, just a camera standpoint sitting on your racks that can allow you to give you that physical control. So I don't see the problem, again, strategically as being any more or less difficult. It just requires a different set of processes to handle the use case. But Ariel, I'll uh, lateral to you if you've got a different opinion. Oh, Kim, I think you got it. You just nailed it on the head. Uh, we call it data on-prem, even though the prem might be across the world. And we really have very similar uh, issues, protections. In fact, internally, we may have less visibility than we would have uh, through a service provider, uh, cloud or otherwise. And in addition to that, uh, we also have the technologies, instrumentation, and frankly, contractual uh, requirements 
that we can use in a cloud provider's environment. We, we can't typically take a box and put it there, but we can typically use instances of many, many, many of the tools that are traditionally an appliance and still deploy them in the cloud and get the view of it. And at a certain point, you have to look at the data at three different levels. Underneath the hypervisor, well, we really shouldn't have data there. And above the hypervisor, being the third level, we can protect the data the same or in a better way because of the nature of, for example, encryption that we are now using as a matter of fact, whereas internally, traditionally, we may or may not have done that. So, and, and yeah. I catch you off, go on, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just gonna say, it is the same issue, it is the same sheep, only now the organization, frankly, understands better why the protection needs to be done and paid for uh, as, a, as, a, as an enterprise. And I'm gonna take this uh, a little further down this rabbit hole, and this gets into cases where, where we've talked about, and I don't want to deviate the discussion too far from DOP, but I believe there's a reason we brought up BYOD and we brought up cloud. These tend to be sticking points in any organization as organizations and businesses try to migrate to optimize, you know, better cost benefit solutions so that they can reduce their costs, increase shareholder and stakeholder value. I, I think as security professionals, we, we may have given ourselves a bad rap because we have said no, no, no versus how, how, how. These are use cases. These are use cases similar to going to wireless back in the day. The challenges that collectively we, I think we've all seen businesses have is they want to reap the benefits associated with jumping to these things without recognizing the risk calculus and the different things that we need to do. But I would submit, particularly amongst my peer group and some of the teams I've worked with and some of the teams I've built, our approach is to figure out how and to partner with the business and say, okay, here's the deal. There are additional things that we may have to do differently to mitigate risk back to the level as if the computer is sitting under my desk. But if you're willing to work with me in that timely fashion, we can do that. So if you take a mature, robust, and again, we use that term from strategy, strategic approach to these problems, these just become other use cases for us to solve. I think the angst from a data standpoint and a protection standpoint, a risk standpoint, is there's a lot of ready, fire, aim that goes on versus true partnership. But if you truly look at it strategically and partner with your security professionals, we solve these type of problems every damn day. We are good at it and we like to do it. Ariel? Yeah, that's yeah. that's exactly the, the way to approach it. Uh, I don't know that I have anything to add here. Yeah, so, so just to summarize this, basically my summary is if you have a great DLP strategy to protect your data, you should not worry about bring your own device or you should not worry about putting data in the cloud. Is that? I, I, would, I would modify it a little bit. Okay. If you take a strategic approach to DLP, then BYOD and cloud become just additional use cases to solve for. You still have to solve for that use case but yes. they become additional use cases to solve for. Excellent, okay. So now let's go to the next question, which is, is there is a DLP strategy for big data? And big data is, becomes a big uh, uh, a buzzword and, uh, and, and, and a lot of uh, people say, well, big data is gonna be very difficult for, for DLP. So any, any comments on that? Yeah, so uh, a lot of people are afraid of this bugaboo of big data. <laughs> big, <clears throat> first of all, we need to define what big data is. Uh, at the very least, uh, we should agree that big data is something that uh, we've seen before. We may have called it under different names, but as long as we configure the IAAA, and as long as we know who is accessing where, what, and what they're doing with the data, and both in terms of monitoring, in terms of uh, logging, but also in terms of prevention via DLP, uh, we are basically looking at yet one more use case of this. The nature of big data, and, and by the way, 
this nature is beginning to be acknowledged uh, regulatorily too, is that one plus one equals three. In other words, the aggregate value of data is something to consider. So um, there are ways to make this a part of a general information protection program. And frankly, uh, to manage it any other way would be a waste of resources and it would use too many variables into a program that's very hard to audit. Uh, just one more point is that you got to keep in mind when you put data into a big data storage, regardless of the structure, uh, who may have access to the data. And while Hadoop, for example, has certain protection techniques that other sets of data may not have, uh, the ultimate control and responsibility rests with you, the, the data owner, and that has not changed. I would only add one thing, and Ariel, you touched upon it, uh, the impact of data aggregation. I, I think that's the one that you know, folks like us, we see, but I don't necessarily think occasionally our business partners will see that impact, where I have two or three sets of autonomous data that in and of themselves are at a lower classification, but when aggregated together can provide that level of intelligence, which is why we actually aggregate that data, and provide that level of intelligence and sensitivity level that takes that aggregated result and moves it higher in my classification schema. So strategically, we understand this. There are technologies that are becoming available for us to parse this, but I don't think on occasion, or I've seen on occasion, that our business partners understand that, yes, you may have additional requirements for security and protection that exists because of that, when you put it very well, Ariel, that one plus one equals three impact because aggregating the data creates a heightened level of sensitivity. So the, for me, strategically, I agree with you. The approach doesn't have to change. The challenge is that education piece as companies begin to dip their toes into this big data thing. Right. What does increase here, and it increases because of the utility that we get from big data, and by the way, to me, big data implies at least, at least that the data can <clears throat> be used for methods and utility that we have not seen when the data was not in the big data container. Uh, but the risk, just like Kim said, increases, and sometimes it may increase really, really rapidly. Even in the United States, in which case there are at least 58 different privacy quotes laws within the different states, uh, the nature of a telephone number is not defined well as a PII. However, a telephone number with a credit card number with a username, which may now be in the same container, has to be looked at in a more uh, robust way and probably elevated in its sensitivity. Excellent. I think uh, that's very interesting. Um, so I got one more question here is how do you mitigate data risk uh, in mobile devices? Will some kind of DLP help us do this? Kim or Ariel, you want to? Kim, you want to go uh, first? Uh, I, I think it goes back to where, what we've said earlier. And in that case, I think you're using DLP more as a tool versus a strategic approach. Now, if we look back to where we, we started in terms of us dealing with that from a people, process, and technology standpoint, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a technologist. If there's a toy out there that can help me, yeah, of course, you know, if it's useful and valuable, I'll make, I'll make good use of it. But if that toy itself does not necessarily exist between handling IAAA, dealing with encryption and other, and other schema in terms of monitoring the environment, I can still mitigate the risk within a mobile environment without a formal full-fledged DLP tool. Ariel? That's, that's excellent, Kim. Uh, the only thing I would add to this is this. Uh, if you are trying to control data that is on an employee device, employee-owned device, or for that matter, an employee-owned cloud, like uh, a Dropbox that somebody would have on their desktop, uh, you already failed. 
you need to look at it as the real core question is, number one, the biggest part of DLP is awareness. Number two is what do you allow to go into a device that you do not control physically or otherwise? And then comes the issue of the tools. If the data is there or allowed to be there, what do you do in order to make sure that it's only disclosed when appropriate? And that involves everything from uh, containerization of the data to encryption and many, many other techniques. But what I'm very weary of is that when I go to a, uh, an event like RSA, I see hundreds, literally hundreds of solutions that don't have problems. So what we're looking at is the tools that A, are easy to integrate when we look at tools, B, can be pervasive throughout most of our use cases, not necessarily every single one, and most importantly, fit within the implementation of the life cycle as we envision it. If it doesn't work, then it doesn't work for us. And I, that last point, Ariel, you, you, we know this, we've done this, that last point's dead on. If it doesn't fit within your life cycle and doesn't fit within your architecture, it's not gonna be used and it's gonna, not gonna be a solution, it's gonna be a problem. Exactly. Excellent. So uh, another question I have here is, uh, uh, what do you think about phishing? Is this a big risk that can be overcome with uh, DLP or a part of the DLP strategy? So I'll take this first. Phishing yeah. is uh, currently one of the most major threats to information security and protection everywhere especially when you see enterprises that have business plans, uh, tools, training, and can afford uh, literally a VC funding at times, only for the purposes of targeting an enterprise via a very, very crafted spear phishing attack. Uh, but yes, uh, in a good DLP program, phishing is handled just like any other type of data leakage. If you click on a link and you try to send a file, uh, that should be detected and stopped. But Again, the very first part is the strategy, where the employee should be made at least a little suspicious of emails say, click here for this. And there are ways to both create the awareness, but also the supply tools that alert the employee, prevent the mail from going in, and prevent cert certain actions like uploading files from taking place. You know that, Ariel, the only thing I would, re I would add for emphasis is that awareness and education piece. That employees, as you said, employees being at least a little bit suspicious of the emails that they're getting and routing them to the right organizations and knowing what to do with them when they get it versus just deleting it because there are things that your security ops teams, et cetera, can do if we're aware. But if 50 people get the same phishing email, and three click on it and everyone else deletes it, the only way I know what's going on is I'm chasing down the three who clicked on it versus somebody sending the emails to the right address so that it can be investigated. We can do things within our tool sets accordingly. Excellent. So basically the, 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 the message here is that the phishing uh, uh, training and awareness, it needs to be part of a DLP strategy, right? So. Okay, so my last question that I have is uh, about uh, e-discovery and e-forensics. And I'd be happy, I would really like to un uh, understand uh, uh, how does uh, DLP uh, uh, has any impact on, on e-discovery and e-forensics? Let me, I'll take this one first. Excellent. I would say this is probably more a matter of less the DLP and more the data life cycle and fitting into your data life cycle management piece or process. Um, every life cycle or, deal, or data life cycle process you know, talks about the creation of data, the protection of data, the storage of data, and the destruction of data. You know, E-discovery in any form or any fashion from my perspective you know, there are controls that sit around 
you know, what I can do, when I can go to eDiscovery, and if I have to place legal holes, et cetera, that bypass my data lifecycle destruction program or destruction process. So yes, you know, any good data lifecycle program which talks about creation or destruction will have provisions that allow me to actually suspend destruction of data for any sort of legal hold or for any need for discovery. I will have the tool sets available to go back as far as my data storage or my data retention policies allow me to do. But I see this more as a data lifecycle impact than necessarily a DLP impact. All of these things are interrelated, but it's more data lifecycle for me than DLP. Ariel? Ariel? I think those are excellent points. Uh, let, let me just add one thing. At GoDaddy, we have a significant portion of the internet as our customers. Uh, when we get uh, requirements for e-discovery from law enforcement, we always try and comply with it. However, because of the data life cycle, sometimes data is no longer available. And that's something that the, the law enforcement and the community of law in general understands well. On the other hand, because we uh, provide such a large chunk of the internet and the number of uh, websites available, we also don't take the responsibility of being the sheriff in town. We do not police 90 million plus websites. We take the approach that we comply with uh, anything lawful, but the data set that we're looking at is our data set, not data set that uh, people pay service for or that uh, people's uh, accounts sometimes get used for. So we try and minimize the data that is in our control in terms of the life cycle. And we also uh, put this part of the strategy. And as the legal framework changes around the world, as the threat landscape change, we always try to be just in sync with that to make sure that we provide the service both to our customers and uh, through discovery requirements. Excellent. Uh, that's, uh, I think that uh, concludes our, our internal questions. Um, so uh, while I'm going through some of the takeaways of this, I would like to uh, open it up uh, for the audience to uh, type in their questions, and uh, we can we can start answering those questions as as they're coming in uh, while I'm uh, doing the takeaways. Okay, so please uh, write down your questions from your uh, panel, uh, and uh, I will go through uh, some of the takeaways. So. Uh, uh, takeaways, uh, DLP is a strategy, not a product. Uh, tools are only part of the solution. All employees and contractors need to be responsible and accountable for cybersecurity. All endpoints can be used as a pivot. All employees and contractors are an insider threat. And DLP starts with a policy that is monitored and enforced. And from the questions that we had uh, uh, just a few minutes ago, I, I, I would like to add a couple of them. One of them is the life cycle of the, of the data is, is, is something that is, is very important and that needs to be part of the strategy. Uh, anything else you would like to add, uh, uh, Ariel or Kim, as a takeaways? I, I would just add you need to be uh, fully aware of the data sets that you have. Not about just one data set or two, but completely at the big picture. Okay. And once you're there, you can make uh, thoughtful decisions on how to handle it. That was the only one I was gonna talk about, so you nailed it. Okay, you. so let's open it up for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I don't see any questions coming up. Uh, Do we want to unmute? Uh... Mario, this is this is Rui from 
from Watchful Software. Um, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for for, for your time, guys. I, I do have a question that, that I'll just I'll just ask it, and then if any of you gentlemen, it's kind enough to to, to give me some insights or, or or the insights that could be done for 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 that. You know, you know, I read on the key takeaways, Mario, that you know, um, security or or a DLP should be a, 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 a worry by any anyone in a company. Right, yeah. um, and anyone should be uh, devoted into um, you know making sure that that DLP process and strategy and, and the tools work, etc. My point being, you know, it's not in their job description, right? I mean, their job description, the user's job description, has nothing to do with uh, with security or anything like that. And and first and foremost, what I believe to be the current state of things is that they sign a, a disclaimer when they're hired that you know. They acknowledge that uh, um, a security policy exists and security practices exist, uh -huh. uh, but then again, they never they never go back to it. So so it's not in their job description. They're there to do their jobs. Is there a way for us to mitigate that uh, gap? Is it by be making them more aware? Is it by training? Is it by uh, making them uh, you know part of the solution and not just uh, users of of systems? You know, I don't know. In, any insights on that? That would be great. So, so let me uh, try to answer that first. Uh, the, so the first thing is, I think the answer is all of the above, but we need to start with first, uh, make sure that people get trained, training and awareness is, is, is very important. But what is even more important is to make sure that we have the, 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 the direction from our senior executives to say, you know, every employee is, you know, responsible and accountable for cybersecurity because A, B and C, and, and, and that helps a lot. Uh, uh, the big problem that I find, and I have been in security for many, many years, is that most people believe that security is the job of the security professionals, and they don't believe it's their job. And, 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 and today, we're taking advantage of some of the events that are happening, and, I, you know, and, and I'm just using the same thing. You see something, say something. I'm doing the same thing with cybersecurity. We're saying you see something, say something, because you are responsible and you need to be accountable for anything that you do. And I have a lot of people, especially in certain uh, groups, that they say that's not my security, it's not my job, it's not my forte, it's not what I do, but we need to do that. So in order to, to, to overcome some of those issues, one of the things that I did was created what I call the Friends and Family Awareness Campaign, where I created material where our employees can take it home and they can become the security hero in their house. And that has been very, very helpful because they have learned a lot about cybersecurity in a process to protect their families, their kids, their moms, their dads, their grandma, grandpas. And by doing that, they became more aware of how can they do a better security for themselves and for the company and for the family, right? That answer? Exactly, and this is wonderful. So we at GoDaddy uh, do something very similar. In fact, <clears throat> we give awards, both spot awards, but more importantly, perhaps, recognition awards to people that bring things to our attention. So certificate, but also web-wide uh, uh, notice, and uh, definitely inside the companies, we hold many events to recognize people and customers that bring issues around security uh, to our attention. Uh, it's a bug bounty program of sort, but far beyond that, it's truly showing people on a regular basis uh, the value of paying attention to security and the value of actually being in the moment. And when you see something, say something, even if it's phishing, we want to know. So that has proven really, really successful. I, I want to add to that, and I actually want to add to what Mario said regarding the executive presence and leadership. My my background is military. I'm a West Point grad, spent over 10 years in, and I, I had a chance to be mentored under um, General Bruce Clark, who was one of the first Supreme Allied Commanders of Europe. I went to school with his grandson. And General Clark had a saying that a unit does well what the commander checks or causes to be checked to which over the years I've added that the commander causes to checks or causes to be checked that which he deems to be of value. Translating that back into the civilian sector, um, we talk a lot about executive buy-in, but what an organization looks at as being important 
is truly set by the tone at the top. Yes, I have an expectation that culturally the environment is go we, we are going to be a victim of circumstance in that the environment is going to assume that if I exist and am, and am doing my job, anything that gets into the environment probably belongs there because the natural assumption is that I am a miracle worker and can stop anything bad, even though we know that, that practically that's not the case. The, the baseline assumption that if it gets into my inbox, it's probably okay. In order to break that assumption beyond education, yes, tone at the top actually does matter. And little things, you see it in physical security areas when the CEO won't wear his badge, nobody else thinks they need to. But when the CEO who forgets his badge stops in where it gets a visitor or rather a temporary employee badge, all of a sudden, oh yeah, that's important. You know, when the CEO or the executives are the ones talking about the importance of phishing and the importance of our data and the importance of if you see something, say something, then all of a sudden you create the culture and environment that begins to look and question and bring you this data. So, yeah, I, I would re-echo this is really tone at the top and executive buy-in. You know, if you really want to make that big a difference, yeah, look, it is everybody's business and it is everyone's job as long as the executives, to be very direct, at, at believe it and value it. If they don't, then you're going to have an uphill problem, not just with DOP, but any portion of your security program. Precisely. Excellent. There is uh, no more questions in there. I'm uh, going to try to unmute, or can we unmute the attendees and see if there's any other more questions? Any questions from the audience? Oops. No more questions? Rui, any other questions or Patricia from your end? Unmuted. Oh, Mario, I mean, I believe, I believe we've, we've accomplished our goal. Uh, I thank you, I thank you, you three gentlemen for, for the insights and the sharing that you were capable to, capable to provide. Um, this was exactly the goal of this Global Thought Leadership Series. Um, again, thank you, uh, Ariel, thank you, uh, Mario, and thank you, Kim, for your insights. For those of you that were watching, we thank you for, for being here. Um, as I've said in the beginning, um, you will be receiving you will be receiving an email with the details um, on how to get uh, uh, this recording on demand and how to have access to the slide deck also um, please join us next time where we will be talking about other topics that relate to the same um, issues the same major issues related to how sensitive information needs to be protected and needs to be prevented from falling into the wrong hands so without anything else to say thank you very much and see you next time Thank you. Thank you, everybody.